Thank you um, very much, Tamara. Um, I know those sounded um, like rather critical and harsh words. Um, and I guess I will echo Tamara's phrase. Um, if they did sound that critical and that harsh and that's where you're still focused, I guess that means you need to pull up your big girl or big man pants. Um, <laughs> Because I think looking at where the social work profession began in the late, um, in the 1890s, this is 2015. Why is it that we are still grappling with these issues today? Why aren't we seeing a reduction, an end to some of the social problems that still are? I know that we at the UW-Madison School of Social Work turn out 300 social work students each and every year. And I think the same is true for every research university, and maybe the smaller universities turn out um, much smaller students, but there's a marching group of social workers who join us every single year. So. Why are the statistics still looking like they are today? And I think that's the purpose of this conference today, to really get us collectively as a group of prof professionals and social work students who will be joining us as professionals to have an honest heart-to-heart -heart talk. What is it that we can do? Because what we've been doing before has not been working. We need to do something drastically different. And so I'll invite our next um, speaker, Mr. Percy Brown. Um, Percy Brown Jr. is a director of equity and student achievement for Middleton Cross Plains Area Schools District, adjunct professor in the School of Education at Edgewood College and vice president of the Equal Opportunities Commission for the City of Madison. Percy is also a doctoral student at Edgewood College and his research focus is race in public education. Prior to his current work, Percy worked for the Madison Metropolitan School District, Dane County Human Services Neighborhood Intervention Program, Boys and Girls Club of Dane County, um, and Madison College. He has been featured on the Mitch Heck radio show several times, Capital City Sunday, Capital Times, and Middle Times for his work and perspective on race in America, Dane County, and Madison. His immediate and future plans are to expand his work and place his efforts on the concept of collective impact and to use that to address race-based inequalities in Madison and Dane County. Welcome, Mr. Percy Brown. Uh, let me just begin by saying thank you to Jalati for Joe Myers and the committee who put together this uh, social work conference with the focus on racial injustice. I don't know if it was by design because of everything that's going on in the community, but I think it's a very important topic that not only needs to be discussed, but also um, looking at what are action steps that we can take place, uh, that we can put in place moving forward. Um, so again, I am thankful to be here to talk to you all this morning. Uh, just like Tamara said, uh, she's from a graduate of Madison Memorial High School. I'm a graduate of Madison West, uh, and I'm a native son of Madison, Wisconsin, and I've worked with Andre Johnson with the Dane County Neighborhood Intervention Program through the Replay Program. Um, so I am here and I am invested and I'm glad to be able to talk to you all. I see Tony Ricker back there somewhere in the back and I know there's some other Nipsters probably in the crowd so it's just good to be back with uh, the social work crew once again. Um, I didn't put together a powerful presentation like uh, Tamara Grisby did because the last few weeks I've been very busy. Um, I've been traveling quite a bit out to the East Coast and then I was out on the West Coast um, and all of this, while I was out of town, the, the situation with Tony Robinson took place, and uh, I've been meeting with Pastor uh, Rayford Harold and a lot of other community leaders to try to uh, put things in place so that the community will be properly prepared for the decision when it comes out. And the last week, uh, Middleton Cross Plains School District was on spring break. Um, so I took a group of high school students, black, white, Asian, and Latino, on a freedom ride. Uh, we reenacted the freedom summer of 1964. Um, so we made our first stop in Memphis, Tennessee, and visited the National Civil Rights Museum where Dr. King was assassinated at the Lorraine Motel, and they've just expanded it. Uh, they actually have the other side, across the street from the hotel, they've... Um, They've redone that and added more artifacts to it, and that was actually the building where James Earl Ray um, shot Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And you know, if you ever have a chance to go to Memphis, be sure you check that out, especially the second side. 
Um, it gives you so much perspective on the investigation um, and the death of MLK, and I was blown away. There is a lot of conspiracy behind that, and if you read it, James Earl Ray was not alone. Um, and we followed that, and we rolled through the Mississippi Delta. We went to Clarksdale, Mississippi. We stopped in Rosedale, Mississippi. Uh, we went to Indianola, Mississippi, and if you know anything about the Mississippi Delta, I'm talking extreme poverty, extreme poverty. Uh, my family, and I consider myself a third uh, generation civil rights activist, um, because my dad's side of the family, who's from Rosedale, Mississippi, were heavily involved in the civil rights movement. Uh, my aunt was actually the first African American to integrate the all-white high school. Um, her along with one other African-American woman, and then my dad came in the following year. Um, so to be able to take those kids to Rosedale High School and to see the graduating class pictures of how it was all white, Asian, and Hispanic, and then by 67, which was 13 years after Brown, you had your first two African-American women, then you had my father that followed, who was the only black in that class, and he has some stories that just blows my mind away to this day. I don't even know how they endured what they went through during that time period. But to see the demographic shift, how by the 90s, it was 50% black, 50% white. But as of 2000 and beyond, it's all black. So that high school or that district has experienced white flight. And guess where all the white kids are? They're not in public education schools. They are in private schools. Um, so what's going on in Mississippi is um, actually a, a resegregation of schools. You know, white folks have just uh, put in extra money to build private schools, and they fled the schools where black students are. Uh, we left the Mississippi Delta and went into Jackson, Mississippi. We visited a couple of historically black colleges. We also visited the home of slain civil rights activist Megger Evers. Um, so, you know, the trip was really powerful. And, you know, for Tamara to comment on Wisconsin being the worst state to raise an African-American child and to be in front of the state of Mississippi just blows my damn mind. It blows my mind. I don't know if you all have ever traveled through Mississippi, but I strongly encourage you to take that trip ride through the Mississippi Delta, see the poverty, see the homes that are barely standing up where there are still people that have to use the bathroom in an outhouse, and to go to Rosedale, Mississippi and see the facilities, not even one complete computer lab. We walked into a biology room, there was no lab. So these kids are taking science without labs, living in Homes where you have to use the bathroom outside, yet it's still better for an African-American child to come through the state of Mississippi than it is the state of Wisconsin. And then for Dane County to be the worst county in the United States of America to raise an African-American child perplexes me when you have the University of Wisconsin-Madison sitting right here, one of the best institutions in the United States of America, you have a city that is founded on strong city and county government. Yes, it is the best place in America to live. But for who? And you know, honestly, I, I don't need the claps right now. And I will try to stay within my 45 minutes um, because today I'm not speaking to you as the Director of Equity and Student Achievement for Middleton Cross Plains Area School District. I'm talking to you as a black man this morning. So what I might say is not gonna generate too many claps, there may not be too many laughs, um, because I have to talk to you real and I have to be honest with you. And we are in a state of emergency and we have some very serious problems in this community. If we can't address these systemic issues and these issues that we have as individuals in Dane County, I feel sorry for the rest of this country as far as racial progress and racial equity but because if we can't find the fortitude, the will, and the commitment with the resources that we have right here in Dane County, the best place to live in the United States of America, right? I mean, the average income for a white family is $65,000 a year. Livability Magazine, Forbes Magazine says, hey, if you want to move somewhere and raise a family, 
come to Madison, Wisconsin, or come to Dane County. But if you look on the other side, my community, the black community, average income for a family of four is about $20,000, $22,000 a year. Income gap of 30 plus thousand dollars. And how can a family of four live on $22,000 a year when I know it costs almost $800 a month just to rent an efficiency in this community? So we've got some very serious issues, but you know, we have to get at why do we have these issues? The data is there. It's clear, it's apparent. I don't think it's just a Dane County issue. It's a nationwide issue. But we fail to dig in and try to figure out what the root causes are. And as a historian, I always like to just go back. You know, because you don't know where you are unless you know from whence you came. And if you don't know that background, how can you even have a vision to try to change the game given your current context. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a history lesson this morning. I'm going to take you back in time and I'm going to lay the foundation as to why I think that uh, we have some of the race-based disparities that we have. Um, and I know that as an educator, the things that I'm going to talk about are not in textbooks. Teachers don't teach this stuff. I know for a fact that they don't. Because what we teach is from the dominant culture and from the dominant perspective. We never have multiple perspectives. And as far as the black experience, we've always been omitted. Our story has never been told. That's why we have a segment of our population that sits there and says, well, the family is broken. That's why we have these issues. Or the men are out here selling drugs. They don't, give a, they don't care about their kids. Or Black people are lazy. Pull yourselves up by your bootstraps and you will make it okay. Because we're under this mindset of if you work hard and you play by the rules, you can make it. That's bull crap. I don't believe that. It's not always been that way. You know, that's a myth that's put out there to reinforce oppression. So I'm just going to take you back a little bit. Uh, I know I've got until about 11 o'clock, so I'll try to go as fast as I can. People who know me sometimes know that I can get up here and start preaching, but I'll try not to preach to you. I don't have the Holy Bible, so I won't recite any scripture. I may leave that for the pastor right over there to the right. <laughs> <laughs> so to give you some historical context uh, as far as race, where did race even come from? How did race even play itself out in America. So there's a book that I read and I use it in my professional development in Middleton because I do teach teachers about how to uh, acknowledge racism, how to have that lens of uh, acknowledging the biases that we all have and what we can do differently uh, when we provide instruction to kids. But there's a book called The White Man's Burden. And it takes us back a little bit in terms of this concept of race and how it developed. And in the 16th century, the English, for the first time, set foot on West Africa. Now, the Portuguese and the Spanish had already been trading and willing and dealing with West Africans. Uh, but their perception was a lot different than the English because uh, there was a point in time where African Moors actually ruled Spain for a few hundred years prior to enslavement of West Africans and then making that, uh, that push over to the Americas. But when the English had their first interaction with West Africans, they were puzzled. That was the first time that they've ever seen humans that had black skin or very, very dark skin. And it was contrary to everything that they believed coming from England. The English back then during the period of Queen Elizabeth believed that white was the natural color of man and that white was associated with being pure, being angelic, you know, right. And the definition of black was the complete opposite. Dangerous, absent of color, um, what were some of the other things? Subhuman. You know, you can even see that in the Webster's Dictionary today if you look at the definitions of white and black, although those, those negative connotations, you have to go into the fourth, fifth, and sixth definitions of black and white. But in the Oxford Dictionary from the 16th century, it was right up there front and center. So that kind of grounded the, the perspective of the English when they stepped foot on West Africa. 
And it was so bad that they were just trying to figure out like, how can a human be so black? And this was also the first time that they had an interaction with orangutans and chimpanzees. So they're like, oh, well, we're from here, we're white, we know we're from Adam, we're the original man, but here we have this other human kind of looking type people, but they're also in the same area of orangutans and chimpanzees. Now you've got this connection right here. They developed, scientists back then developed what you call the great chain of being. And it was based on skulls. And I mean, they even tried to figure out where the parakeet uh, fit into that because they could speak a little bit if you train them. So, you know, of course the white skull was at the top and then as the shades of color got a little bit darker, that meant that you were more inferior. And it was so bad and they were so perplexed and trying to figure out this whole thing between the black Africans and the orangutans, that they basically came to the conclusion that they were connected. And that oftentimes the male orangutan would actually sleep with the African woman. So this laid the groundwork for the construction of race. The science behind it was about skin color and that the darker your skin color was, the more inferior you were. But recent research says that there's no such thing as race in terms of biology and intelligence. It's a social construction. It's not real, although it's real in the sense of how things play out in America. So here we go, I'm gonna fast forward you to 1619. First Africans landed on American soil. And you know, there was this period of indentured servitude uh, where if you work for seven years and you would be released. There were some Africans that came over that were a part of that but the first slaves, enslaved Africans, actually set uh, foot in the United States in 1619. And then we had the Constitution of the United States that was written in the late 1700s. And clear as day, that set the separation between blacks and whites and was set the stage for what we're experiencing right here today. Blacks were not considered humans. We were considered three-fifths of a man because of government in the House of Reps. The Southern slave owners were like, we want to be able to count our slaves so that we can have more representation in the House. The compromise was, well, okay, well, although they're property, we know they're a little human, but all right, we'll count them three-fifths. And that set the tone, although the Declaration of Independence said what? We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. So we have these two great documents that were grounded in hypocrisy. And we never talk about that. That's never taught in our schools. And we're always talking about critical thinking, right? But we don't even lay that out for our kids to examine. So that, that was in place until 1865. We had the great Civil War, right? And they said that this was a war that was over slavery. And it was kind of over slavery. It was really about economics. That's what it was about at the end of the day because it wasn't really about freeing blacks and giving them full rights because you have to remember, we were considered chattel property. So it wasn't about humanity. It was about economics and the fact that the South was making a lot of money. The North wasn't making that much money and the South was all about states' rights. And that's why we had a civil war. So then comes Lincoln in 1863, I believe, the Great Emancipation Proclamation that supposedly freed the slaves, right? It was simply a proclamation. It didn't, it didn't free slaves. Um, it was a document that said, well, in the South, you're no longer considered a slave, but you gotta remember, Lincoln had no control over the South because they had their own form of government called the Confederacy. But we teach that the Emancipation Proclamation freed the slaves. There's a reason why. It was actually the 13th Amendment that abolished slavery. But within that amendment, it says that yes, slavery is abolished, except for those who have been convicted of a criminal offense. So, someone commits a crime, they're subjected to the same conditions of involuntary servitude. Why don't we teach that in schools? So once that 13th Amendment was passed, 
Here's something that you probably don't know. Some of you may. White man's always smart, right? They knew they put that in there for a reason. So between Reconstruction in the 1940s, because of the 13th Amendment, there was a series of vagrancy laws that were put into place that were targeted at African-American males. That was a way to re-enslave blacks. And what I mean by vagrancy laws is that I could be walking down the street. If I looked at you and the police officer saw that, boom. I get 20 years in prison. And once I got that 20 year bid, what they would do was issue out convict leasing. So those plantations were getting black men again, but through the criminal justice system, through vagrancy laws. I mean, ridiculous laws. Really? If I looked at you, I could get 20 years, or if I didn't step off the sidewalk, you're gonna give me 20 to 25 years? And what protections did we have as a people? And this was the police department. So I'm gonna get on into that too as to why the black community is upset with what's been going on with all of these murders with no charges from the police department. There's history behind that. And I get sick and tired of people talking about, well, what does black lives matter? Why can't it be all lives matter? because everybody else doesn't have the history with the police department like the black community has. When you go through 60 or 70 years of having to deal with vagrancy laws and having to be put right back on the plantation after you told you've been freed, but you go right back because of the criminal justice system, it's unjust. So that happened for a period of 60, 70 years. Not, not only to mention the fact that at some point uh, during Reconstruction, they were saying, well, maybe we'll give the blacks 40 acres and a mule. That fell on deaf ears. That was our opportunity to kind of level the playing field as far as economic development, but it didn't happen. But guess who got reparations? Slave owners got reparations from the federal government. And if you don't believe me, email me. I will send you literature that will show that those things actually happened. So again, slavery ended, slave masters benefited from the freeing of their slaves, even though they got those reparations, but then the black men came right back on the plantation because they got locked up by the police department. So this was in play until the 1940s, and there was something else that was going on between the late 1880s and 1940s. Just straight up, outright, terrorism on the black community. Between that period of the 1880s, which was during the Reconstruction period in the 1940s, there are 3,959 lynchings on record of blacks that was committed by the white community. I mean, just straight out terrorism. And I'm not talking about the Klan burning crosses and all that, my family experienced that, but lynchings, and I mean, when those things took place, oftentimes there were public gatherings where the whole town would come with their kids, have their picnic, that's what they called it, picnic. What do you think picnic means? It's a short version of pick a nigga. Nigger, I mean, I'm sorry about that, I know it's a new form, N-I-G-G-A, but it was pick a nigger because it was a festival to see a black person be lynched. And it wasn't just hanging from a tree. Oftentimes it was slow torture. Cut the tongue off, cut the hand off, let them hang and jerk. And people were amused by that. And then sometimes they would finish it off by pouring gasoline on the body before they were all the way dead, set it on fire. And I'm talking about two, three, four thousand people, the entire town coming to watch this. So what is the mindset of those people? If they could sit there and watch a human be tortured and die the way that they did, and then it happened 3,959 times. And those are just lynchings that happened through the 1940s. Gotta catch my breath here for a minute. And let me just backtrack and say this. I know 
um, in the work that I do when we have these conversations about race. I know oftentimes it's difficult, um, but I know you all are social workers, so I'm challenging you right now. Um, and I know some of this stuff may be hard to take in, but I think that you have to understand that in order to really do the work that you need to do and to be able to challenge yourself moving forward. Um, and just knowing that, you know, this stuff is not your fault. Like Tamara said, get rid of the guilt right now. Embrace what you're, what you're getting and hopefully it can make you reflect on, on your work, how you are as an individual, how you do your work and what you can do moving forward as a collective. So this was going on through the 1940s. Then right around the late 40s, early 50s, we started to see black people say enough is enough. We were like, we have to start fighting for our rights. So we saw the passing of, or the, the civil rights, not the civil rights, but the um, Supreme Court decision in 1954, Brown versus the Board of Education decision, which desegregated all schools. And although that was somewhat of a victory, America was not ready to integrate its schools. Like I said, my aunt was the first to integrate Rosedale Consolidated High, and it was 1966. That's 12 years after Brown. Other school districts and localities it probably took longer than that. And I'm gonna hit you right here at home with Madison, Wisconsin. Madison, Wisconsin has been segregated for decades. I grew up on the south side of Madison, right down the street from Maya Johnson and Andre. And um, when I was in fifth grade at Lincoln Elementary School, 1984, 30 years after Brown, you know the federal government had a mandate on Madison Metropolitan School District and said if you don't put together a desegregation plan, we are going to come after you. Because Lincoln Elementary and Franklin Elementary were black and brown and Southeast Asian. There weren't too many white students. So here we are in Madison, Wisconsin, 30 years after Brown, being forced by the federal government to have to implement a desegregation plan. So what they did was they paired Lincoln and Midvale, Franklin and Randall. And that was the first time I had ever seen so many white kids in, in a school. <laughs> like, I was like, wow, where y'all coming from, you know? <laughs> You know, and I mean, you know, I'm from the South Side, so we were all neighborhood, but then I'm seeing these white kids coming from nice homes and money, wearing tree-torn shoes and stuff. I mean, like, it's a whole different level of society right here. Um, but that was the first time that I also met Gus Doyle, who was the only black kid at Midville Elementary School. And uh, that's the, the former governor's son. And it was funny, because when he got off the bus, that was the first time that he ever saw some black people. And he was like, hey guys, and we turned around like, <laughs> like who was that? Like the only brother getting off the bus from the west side of Madison, right? And uh, Gus and I have been, you know, friends ever since. I mean, he's one of my best friends, but you know, it's just kind of like 30 years later. It took 30 years for Madison to have to acknowledge that there was a problem of segregation within its public schools, but we also know that the housing is also segregated. So we had that put in play. Brown versus the Board of Education. Then you had the Voting Rights Act of uh, 1965, which was post-Selma. And you still see that people were violent because they called it Bloody Sunday. And then other civil rights legislation was passed in the late 60s. That was just policy. It was policy. Did it really change the disparities? Did it change the mindset of America, I'm not quite sure it did, because even with the passing of those bills, I mean, my grandfather didn't vote for the first time until he was 68 years old. And this is in Mississippi. And then to see MMSD have to go through a desegregation plan in the 1980s, even though this was 30 years after Brown, and education disparities have always been here in Madison. Tamara spoke to it. I saw it. Cherokee High School, I, you know, I tested out, so I was in some advanced, place, advanced classes, math classes, but I was the only one. All of my homeboys from the South Side were labeled LD. I didn't see them in my classroom unless it was Jim. 
And I'm sitting here, you know, I'm trying to figure it all out. And actually, I was a little jealous. Not because they were LD, but they were in a self-contained classroom with one teacher, and she was fine as I don't know what. <laughs> so I was trying to figure that. I'm like, should I try to become LD so I can be in that classroom? <laughs> you know, um, but as I got older, I was kind of like, man, that's kind of messed up. I said, never had my homeboys in class like that. Um, and it even happened when I was at West. I was oftentimes the only black kid in my class. I had no relationships with anybody. And my guidance counselor called me in my senior year out of surprise. Because I graduated from West High School with a 1.97. I was a partier in high school. And I did roll over to Memorial when that race riot happened because my homeboys needed some help. Um, but I took the ACT. I took the ACT hung over too, I'm just gonna tell you the truth. <laughs> I got drunk the night before. I used to go to barrel parties and stuff like that, but don't tell any of my high school kids this. Um, <laughs> so my mama woke me up at like 7.40 in the morning, boy, get your butt up. I'm like, well, you gotta go take the ACT. So I drove to West, I took the ACT, <laughs> and my guidance counselor called me in because he was like, Percy, he was like, you scored in the mid-20s. I didn't know that, I was like, really? He was like, yeah, that should grant you automatic admission into some universities. And you know, as I got older again, it's like, I had talent all the time. But nobody at West High School took the time to identify that talent. I know it happened for white kids, but why didn't it happen for me? And why didn't it happen for other black students that may not have shown potential with their grades, but were very intelligent had they been encouraged, had they had relationships? That's the key piece too, authentic relationships with those that you serve. So that's education. And I'm gonna backtrack just a little bit in terms of why I think inequity still exists. You know, we always hear, you know, people say about black people, you need to pull yourselves up by your bootstraps, right? You shouldn't rely on government assistance. The white community has received assistance from the federal government. Um, if you think about the Federal Housing Authority in the 1940s, that was the big thing that created wealth for the middle class through low interest loans for homes, that was the boom of the suburbs, right? You think that that was afforded to everybody in America? No. Blacks were excluded from that process. Even blacks who took their behinds over there to Europe to fight in World War II, and when they came back home and they had the GI Bill and some money and they saw the FHA, they wanted that house denied through redlining. These neighborhoods are exclusive for white. Nope, you can't do it. And prior to that, in the late 1800s and early 1900s, the federal government gave away millions of acres of farmland to be cultivated to help build the agricultural economy of the United States. I mean, they were giving land away for free and resources to be able to develop that, as well as subsidies when there was surplus. But again, who was the federal government helping? White communities, blacks were excluded. So that's why you see some of the things that you see today. It's always been put in place. The system has always manifested itself to oppress. And it is grounded in racism. That's just the bottom line. When this country was founded, it was founded for white men that were 21 years of age or older. Yes, women were excluded. But this was a country by and for white men, but built on the backs of blacks. And here we are in 2015, and people are kind of throwing their arms up in the air saying, well, it's, black people just don't, they just don't get it or they don't have the energy, or they're unwilling to work hard. Bull crap. 
let's go back in history and follow the timeline. And you tell me at what point in time in American history that the game changed, that the playing field was really level. But they don't teach that. They only teach history from one lens, and that's from the victor. Not the oppressed. The oppressed voice has always been suppressed or never heard. Even Dr. King. I'm so sick and tired of Dr. King Day because whenever we celebrate that day, it's always, I have a dream. And what's the big line? That one day what? Right. Don't judge me by the color of my skin, but by the content of my character. We've minimized this great man to that one line. And that one line has justified America to come into this racism without racists through colorblindness. Well, Dr. King said, you know, we should be colorblind. What do you mean, colorblind? I work with teachers. I hear teachers say it all the time, but I challenge them real fast. So you mean to tell me when you see me, you don't see color? I'm the only black certified staff in the district, and you mean to tell me you don't see my black skin? You have got to be kidding me. And I take insult to that as a black man. As ugly as my history is, I'm proud of who I am. And I also understand the fight that lies ahead. So don't dismiss me. Don't dismiss my color. Yes, I know race is not real. It's a social construct. But we're dealing with centuries of issues based around race. So we just can't dismiss it with a term called colorblind. And it's, it's probably more devastating than overt racism, to be honest with you. Um, you know, at least in Mississippi, you know, white folks, when they racist, they're going to let you know. And I have an appreciation for that, to be honest with you. If that's how you feel about me, cool, I can dig it, because I know where to stay in my lane, I know which way to move so that I don't have to have those interactions with you. But in Madison, I, we're so liberal that there's nowhere in the world that we can be racist, right? These racial disparities just, just happen by chance. But when I see young, gifted, and black protesting, and when I see articles in the, in the Cap Times about what young, gifted, and black may be doing or a comment that may come from a black leader, and then I read the comments underneath that. Do you all read the comments? <laughs> I'm just waiting for that march with the white sheets and robes. But, you know, they're hiding behind technology, but the things that they say, they're not saying the overt N-word or anything like that, but those comments, you know, just because a man made a mistake a year ago, it justified a police officer shooting him multiple times. And I'm not just talking about Tony Robinson, Michael Brown, Eric Garner, Tamir Rice, the 50-year-old black man who was clearly running away for a taillight infraction? Walter. Yeah, Walter Scott. Eight shots hit three times. A naked man in Georgia. And the law basically puts it in place for a cop to just say, I felt threatened. And that gives you the right to unload. And it's easily justified because, go, like I said, go again, look at the definition of black and the stereotypes that are put on black men. We are a danger. And it's, being, it's propaganda. It's no different than what Hitler was doing with the Jews. And some of that is self-inflicted, though, with the rappers and stuff. I mean, they can, they can sing a different message. Rap wasn't always like that. Rap's not about gangsters and hoes. The birth of hip hop was a movement of self-consciousness, self-awareness, challenging the system, but it's changed. But a lot of that has to do because the recording, the CEOs from the recording labels are in bed with the prison industrial complex system, but that's another story. I know a lot. 
I could probably even talk to you about the JFK conspiracy a little bit. <laughs> Just call me the conspiracy theorist. Um, so, you know, we got all of these things in play, and, I, and I'm, I'm going to wrap it up because I know I'm pretty much past my time, but um, there's just one last thing I want to talk about, and I, and I encourage you all to read this book, uh, The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in the Age of Colorblindness. Um, it's such a deep read, and it, it helps put into context, you know, what has really happened as far as the last 30 years. I gave you a lot of history, but... The new Jim Crow really will open your eyes to what has been happening the last 30 years. Um, the federal government, just in a nutshell, basically, you know, encouraged police departments, local law enforcement agencies to take on this war on drugs. And initially, they didn't even want to do it. They were like, we don't really have a problem like that. We're trying to find murderers and all this other stuff. So then the federal government said, okay. We're going to have billions in grants to give to you all if you decide to take this on as a major initiative. What agency is going to turn down money to be able to hire more people um, and just to be a vibrant you know, organization that doesn't have to worry about money? So they did that. But the dilemma was, where are they going to launch this war? Who are they going to go after if America has this big drug problem? Are they going to go into the Bishop's Bay? Or are they going to go into Seminole Hills or Seminole Forest? They chose the south side of Madison, Somerset Circle, Fisher Street, Magnolia Lane, uh, Simpson Street before it became... Uh, yeah, yeah, there it is, yeah. My dad revitalized it, and I, if my dad was here right now, he'd slap me like, boy, you don't remember that? Um, so that, that rocked the black community. I saw so many of my homeboys, because they were experiencing generational poverty, that they, you know, it's kind of like, man, I can take, get 3.5 grams of crack cocaine and flip it and make a $500 profit in less than a couple of hours. Now you can go feed your family, you can get steak and potatoes, not that government cheese that used to be out there back in the day. Um, you can get the Air Jordans. So it was almost kind of like this trap. But then the police departments were targeting poor communities of color. And if any of you all went to UW Madison, you know good and well UW-Madison probably has more drug trafficking <laughs> than the Southside, Allied, and everywhere else combined, right? I know this, but they don't go there because if they arrest those college kids or if they go into Bishop's Bay, now you're dealing with lawyers, judges, doctors. So that's bias, very bias. And once those, once those brothers were locked up, not only did they have to serve crazy time because of the 100 to 1 powder versus crack cocaine, which crack cocaine is kind of a poor man's drug, powder is for the well to do, but you can have 100 grams of powder, one gram of crack, and you get the same amount of time. You talk about disproportionate. And if that policy wasn't racist, I don't know, or what, socioeconomic, or both, it's a serious issue. But once those young men or women were charged, they became second class citizens. You lose your right to vote. Can't really better yourself because you can't even access financial aid. So what do you do once you do that time and you get back out and then you're labeled a drug felon and you're black? What are the chances that you will actually have an opportunity to better yourself? Not many, you'll end up doing the same thing over again. And I've seen that happen in this community time and time again. So this is what we're facing. These are the things that have been put in place. It's impacting our community in a major way. I know for some of you, you may not have been in some of these neighborhoods. You don't have to. It's very easy, like Tamara said, to just drive by and not ever have to even see what's happening. But I do believe in 
duty to one another. I do believe in community. I've straddled the white and black community all of my life, and I have an appreciation for both. My dad and my uncle found their way up here because of freedom riders from UW-Madison that rolled down to the Mississippi Delta and stayed with my folks and helped with voter registration. And they went down into hostile territory where they could have lost their lives. So there is something about Madison. There is something about this community. If we're willing to drop the guilt, educate ourselves, look at racism from an individual level, a structural level, and an institutional level, and working together and not in isolation of one another. What social workers do should not be working independently of our public schools. We should not be working independently of the criminal justice system or our areas of economic development it requires collective impact. We all have to be on the same page with the same focus if we really, really, really want to get at some of these systemic inequities that exist. And I will even go as far to say, you know, there is even a responsibility within my own community to do more. We've got to do more, but we've got to wake up and drive the agenda with our social workers, with our United Ways of the World, with the Boys and Girls Club, with MMSD, Middleton Cross Plains, and other entities, because what we've been doing hasn't been working. You know, I think for the most part, you know, United Way can say, well, we're gonna do this for the black community. Or Urban League can say, well, we're gonna do this for the black community. But as a community, we have to kind of wake up and say, you know, maybe we have to think outside the box. All of us need to think outside the box to change the game. Um, but I think that is just a piece of collective impact. Again, that's everybody working closely together and not independently of one another. And that's the work that I have um, in place moving forward because I do want to make a difference. And I thank you all for your time. Uh, if you have any questions after this, feel free to catch me. I can give you my business card. But, you know, you all are doing great work. Social work is tough work, very tough work. But I think you just need to add one more line or one more word to your title. Social activists. Social activists. Go beyond just social work and get into social activism. And if we do that, if we all take on that, we will change the game. So thank you for your time.